And by the way, there's a new edict out that those who are in outdoor restaurants, according to Newsom, this just came out last week, that you have to wear your mask in between bites. I am serious. This is, yeah, this is the micromanaging that's going on by our governor. So I don't know how you do it. I just take it down, take a bite, put your mask on, take what, whatever. It's so ridiculous. So when we didn't see the numbers, we, this is now in March, I mean in May now, um, uh, near uh, Mother's Day, and I was just feeling this, uh, really, this, this ream of this revelation coming to my heart that we need to meet for Pentecost Sunday. We miss Easter, we miss Palm Sunday, but we should gather on May 31st on Pentecost Sunday. So we made the decision that we we're going to open up. And, um, and so ironically, the governor allowed us to meet for like a month and a half. But during the time that we were allowed to meet, he said this, no singing or chanting. Now, I didn't know where he got the chanting from. I guess they're Hare Krishnas in California, but he said no singing or chanting. And, uh, it, and this is so ridiculous because the Constitution, our First Amendment says that the state will not establish a religion, a state religion, nor interfere with the free exercise thereof. It's the first time an elected official is telling us how to worship there is a separation, not that we're not to be involved and engaged in politics, but there's a separation where the state cannot be involved with the church. And for the first time, he's telling us how to worship. And then again, we said, with all due respect, we're going to let the high praises of God be in our mouth. We're going to war through our worship. And so we worshiped and we opened up on uh, uh, May 31st, and we've been open ever since. And what happened was is that um, what happened was is that uh, when he locked down for the second time after a month and a half of this window, and by the way, it was not only no singing or chanting; it had to be a hundred people or less. And so he was managing all the large churches in California could not gather together. It wasn't really worth it for a hundred and less. And so we didn't even comply with that. We said we're going to open. We did encourage people again with underlying condition to stay home, uh, but we said uh, if you're if you're able to come and worship with us. We didn't have children's ministry, so that took care of the parents. They stayed home. And so I would say 50% of our congregation came out on uh, May 31st. But we've been meeting. So when he locked down the seventh time, here's what happened. He said he was very specific, no Bible studies, no prayer meetings. You can't meet in home. If you actually go to another person's house to pray for someone with COVID, you're doing it illegally. And so now he's saying not just church services, no worship, period. Because one of the things that were, you know, uh, Rick Warren, for example, was really into small groups saying this is ideal for our small group ministry because we don't have to meet on Sundays, but we should just allow our small groups to flourish. He locked that down as well. It's unbelievable. And then meanwhile, the George Floyd tragedy takes place and our city is just rioting, protesting. I have a picture of 100,000 people in Hollywood marching shoulder to shoulder, no masks, no social distancing, and Governor Newsom gets on television the next day with a press conference and says, we want to just commend you. Your voices need to be heard. You need to exercise your First Amendment rights, and God bless you. These are actual quotes from Governor Newsom. But no God bless you to the church. The hypocrisy, the duplicity of allowing the protest, and we agree with freedom of speech, as long as it's not violent. So yeah, they're exercising First Amendment rights, but what about our First Amendment rights? And at that point, something rose up within me. <laughs> it's like a righteous anger. You know, I feel the church has been like the, the Lamb of God. We've been so meek. But there's a, an aspect of Jesus that I feel that needs to come forth, and that's the line of Judah. <laughs> and, um, and so we, we just said, um, you know what, we're going to sue you. And so I contacted my attorney, um, Matt Staver, with Liberty Council, because we had grounds, no singing, no chanting, no Bible studies, no prayer meetings. Plus, he's commending the protesters, so that dichotomy gave us the basis to say, this is discrimination. You're discriminating against the church. So we're in a lawsuit. And uh, pray for me because we're now at the Ninth Circuit. We lost at the district court. It was an Obama appointee. 
And now we're before the Ninth Circuit, which is the most liberal circuit out of the 11 circuits in America. 70% of the Ninth Circuit's decision are overturned by the Supreme Court, to give you an idea how left they are. And so we're, at, at, there's 29 judges, but uh, uh, it's a lottery system, and they pick three out of 29, and you don't know who you're going to get. Most of them are Obama appointees and Clinton appointees. Now, the good news is that President Trump has now appointed seven federal judges to be on the Ninth Circuit, so we're, there's a chance that we'll get a <laughs> President Trump choice. And I think that's maybe one of the greatest achievements uh, by the end of this year will be 300 federal judges that have been appointed, including three Supreme Court justices, to be confirmed, I believe, with, uh, with uh, Amy Barrett. Now, so pray for us, and, uh, but here's the point. Uh, there's only a handful of churches. You know, California has more evangelicals than any other state except for Texas. And yet only a handful of churches have opened up. And the Lord began to speak to me from 2 Timothy 1.7 that God's not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Now, what's really interesting about that word fear is not your normal Greek word, phobos, which we get the word phobia from. It's a very rare Greek word. It only appears two times in the New Testament, once in this passage in 2 Timothy 1, but the other in Revelation 21, and it's the Greek word dylea. And let me give you the context of how that's used in Revelation 21, that when he, the final day, the great day of judgment before the Lord, he will throw murderers, adulterers, and then this word coward, cowards. It's the word cowardice. So it's not giving us the spirit of being a coward, but power, love, and a sound mind. I feel that the church has been moving in this kind of fear. Instead of being bold, the righteous are bold as the lion. They have been cowardly. And, uh, and so it's just only a handful of churches have stood up and said, we're opening up. One of them is John MacArthur. I mean, this is so amazing because John MacArthur has been criticizing us uh, as holding these strange fire conferences right down the road. There's a church. He's talking about us. And because we have these Revival Alliance conferences in Pasadena. And, said that this is, and yet we're in the same boat together. How do you know God has a, a funny way of bringing his church together? And so, <laughs> so we're with uh, John MacArthur and, uh, and then Jack Hibbs with uh, Chena Hills uh, Calvary Chapel. One of us will go to the Supreme Court. It may not be us. You don't ask to go. You have to be chosen. But there's three that are challenging the state of California for our constitutional right to meet as a church. And one of us will go to the Supreme Court. And with Baird being nominated, most likely will be a 6-3 majority. And so we're not worried about this. We're not worried about this. But I'm just, all this to say that this election is the most consequential, the most important election of our lifetime. Because if the left wins, come on, our religious freedom will be taken away, big time. I was asked by my spiritual sons, I said, what, what happens if uh, the Democrats win? I just said, well, it's the beginning of the persecution of the church. We're experiencing a small microcosm of what's going to be on a macro level. Uh, because our, you know, in California, it's a one-party state. Even when people run for state assembly or state senate, there's two Democrats running. It's not even a Republican Party. It's that they don't even make it to that final uh, election. And it's so sad because there's so many evangelicals in California that are qualified to run. But I, I think, and people say, why? Why? I think part of it is, uh, part of it is, is that we've gone so secret sensitive that we've not become relevant in the church. Part of it is our eschatology. We're just thinking that everything is going to get worse and worse and then Jesus will rapture us out of here. How many know Jesus asked us to occupy until he comes back? He asked us to disciple nations. Not make disciples in nations, but disciple nations, which is a big difference. We're to bring about transformation. I'm not talking about theocracy. I'm not talking about uh, the dominion mandate or dominionism. I'm talking about being salt and light. The picture I have is that when you go to a buffet in, in the south here, you know, a southern buffet, you get your food, but you don't put salt on, in the corner of the plate. 
But that's the way the church is. We're just in one corner, just huddled together, doing our own thing, singing kumbaya. We're to spread the salt throughout the plate. We're to be the salt of the earth, not just salting ourselves. And so we have to get out of the four walls of this building and we have to occupy, we have to be salt and light and we have to make a difference. Every one of you, you're in the marketplace, you're kings and priests. Revelation 1, 6 says you're kings and priests. I like the way it says in uh, 1 Peter 2, 9, you are a royal priesthood. Tell the person next to you, say you're one good looking priest. Go ahead and say that. 